Welcome to the Career Medis Podcast. I am your host, Nisar Ahmad, and I am the founder and editor of the blog, careermedis.com. And this is episode 39 of the Career Medis Podcast. And today's episode is one of the many in the series of what I call personal branding series. I usually interview individuals who have really taken their individual brands to new heights. These are individuals we all can learn from in, for improving our unique brands to take our career business to the next level. And for today's uh, episode, I'm interviewing Amy Ostriker. It's, uh, and I'm actually very excited to interview Amy. She is, has a career that is multifaceted. She's a speaker, she's an artist, she's a performer, she's a playwright, she's an actress, survivor, she's a writer for Huffington Post. Uh, she's an author of an upcoming book called My Beautiful Detour. And also, she's also a TEDx speaker, which is amazing. It's very rare I meet come across someone who has so many things going on. So, Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I actually have breaking news with the TEDx. I just found out this week I'm giving another one next month. <laughs> so, very excited for that. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, I have to say that is two-time TEDx speaker. <laughs> That's uh, that, 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 is, that is exciting. Uh, so, I, before I get into the interview, I always ask my guests this question because I have got guests from around the world and it's always exciting to hear where they are calling from. So, Amy, where exactly are you calling from? From Westport, Connecticut, which is like an hour from New York. Oh, great. I, I believe this is the first time for me speaking to someone from Westport, Connecticut. Could you share an interesting fact or something that most people do not know about Westport unless they have been there. Oh, okay. I, I have one for this, actually. Apparently, there's a, a new show on ABC Family making fun of uh, the people in uh, Westport. Yes, I, I have not seen it, but I forget what it's called, but it is based in Westport, Connecticut. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, so that uh, show is probably making the town more famous that's that's great to hear yeah um, i don't know if it's, it's portraying it well but uh but yeah check your listing <laughs> yeah i did not know if you uh heard of the show called the office that used to be around for many years they were based in a oh, town, i love that yeah they were based in a town called scranton i think it was called scranton pennsylvania and uh yeah and that sh- i mean i'm sure that town became famous and a lot of people it, it sticks to your mind even if you have never been to pennsylvania that town always comes to my mind. So it's always good to have a show that is based in a a particular town or a city. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's always interesting, I guess. (laughs) So one of the reasons I was excited to have you as a guest, many months ago, I think almost a year ago, I wrote a post, a blog post on dealing with career adversity uh, as this blog is more geared towards professionals and also job seekers. It was all about how to bounce back Let's say something happens to you in your career, a job loss, a layoff, a downsizing. But I, when I came across your profile, I thought the challenges job seekers face is nothing. So I was, I'm actually very, I was inspired by your story. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to well, thank talk. you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really excited to learn more just to give people perspective of how you can take an adversity or a series of adversities and turn it around. So... I don't want to steal your thunder. Maybe it'll be better if I hear from uh-huh. you. If you can tell us a little bit about a uh, high level in, uh, introduction about yourself. Who is Amy Ostriker? Who Who is Amy Ostriker? That's a good question. Um, so not only have I had adversity, um, that's actually informed and kind of shaped what I do business wise. I don't, I definitely wouldn't be doing what I'm doing without it. Um, so, so backing up, um, I was just kind of musical theater. That was what I was doing. Um, And um, that was, you know, I was very driven. And that was how I thought I was going to live my life as a very driven musical theater ham. 
Um, you know, when I was 15, I had a voice teacher who I really trusted and he was my mentor. And then, you know, at 17, you know, he started sexually abusing me and I completely froze. You know, I, I left my body and I, I don't even remember anything that happened. You know, I just felt very numb and not like myself at all, but I, I couldn't really, I was so numb, I didn't even know what was going on. And how I actually found out or realized what had happened to me is I happened to open a book um, about sexual abuse you know, by accident. And I happened to flip open to the page of symptoms. And when I saw it was, you know, I feel numb, I feel out of body, I don't trust myself anymore. I realized like, wow, could something like this that like I only hear on Dateline, you know, does that happen to people like me? And and then after that, you know, I I really felt like I was carrying this dark secret that I didn't know what to do with. Um, and until it was really just physically just eating away at me, you know, carrying that that weight. Um, so I told my mother finally the April of my senior year and, you know, we were going to get therapy and everything. And then two weeks later, I just had a really bad stomach ache and it wouldn't go away. And so my dad decided to take me to the emergency room just for like an x-ray. And um, apparently everything just escalated very quickly um, in the car. Like my cheeks just like perforated because there was so much pressure. Um, I got out of the car and I collapsed. And I guess I had gotten septic from a blood clot. That was just a ticking time bomb. I guess when the surgeons cut into me, my stomach actually hit the ceiling of the operating room because there was so much pressure. Both my lungs collapsed and I needed 122 units of blood. And I woke up from a coma months later, you know, having no clue what the heck was going on. You know, I had just gotten my college acceptance letters that week. So yeah, I was really, I've never been to the hospital before. You know, it was really a totally new reality. And I didn't really know what was going on until doctors told me that my stomach, you know, I didn't have a stomach anymore and I couldn't eat or drink now. And they didn't know if I would ever be able to again. So that was, you know, a lot to process. It took even longer to process or for my parents to convince me that I wasn't going to college the next year. And so I think it was my benefit that like I had never really been sick before because I wasn't really sure how to act like a victim or a patient. Um, I also had the support of my family. But like I think because I had always been super, super driven my entire life, I think that it filled me with this like manic drive to just like stay vital and, and keep doing stuff. So um, like I was probably the most stubborn patient there. You know, as soon as I could walk, um, I was like the patient that the nurses could never find because I was always like doing marathons around the unit. You know, I think I was just determined that like I didn't want to be a has-been at 18. So I was discharged months later because you know, I was medically stable now, like all the inflammation had gone away. And the one problem was I still didn't have a stomach. So I was home on IVs and the doctor told me like, yeah, you know, live a nice life at home. Um, we'll check up on you every now and then. But like, you can't even have an ice cube or eat anything. And, you know, we'll touch base every now and then and see if that changes. <laughs> so talk about like total uncertainty, uh, which is very scary when you're in a house with a sink and a fridge and like you're in the world where people walk around with like water bottles and there's McDonald's and, you know, it was a very scary way to live. So I had to become very numb. Uh, I basically just kept doing things because I was definitely not the kind of person that was just going to go home and lie in bed. I think I just, again, this like neurotic feeling like I have to, you know, prove I exist. You know, I have to stay vital. I, as a performer and, you know, I always wanted attention and this was not going to be how I was going to get attention by just being sick. So like, you know, a month after the hospital, 
I auditioned for a local musical and I got the lead and, you know, it was a lot better than just moping around that I couldn't drink. You know, it it got me through. And then I found that, you know, I was so obsessed with food, even though I couldn't eat it, that all I wanted to do was kind of like play with candy. So I ended up actually starting a chocolate business because like I just wanted to play with candy um, and that actually became like an actual thing where I was like shipping out chocolate like all over the country <laughs> and it was a great way for me to feel creative and like I was actually doing something as a person not just like a patient and also you know to not be in the outside world I We just like lock myself in my room for hours and just journal and journal. But but again, there was this drive in me that like whatever I did, I couldn't just sit there, you know, like creating was how I was like proving, I think, to myself that I was alive Um, because, you know, sometimes it was hard to tell when you're like hooked on IVs and and you can't break up your day with meal time. It's kind of like a very surreal way to live. And you know, again, like a lot of uncertainty. What took so long was all of my insides had to repair. But what took even more years is we had to find a surgeon that was crazy and creative enough to figure out what to do with my insides. (laughs) That was really what took so long. So it turned into six of the past um, 10 years, not able to eat or drink anything. And 27 surgeries before I was reconstructed. And even that had a lot of setbacks. Originally, I was supposed to eat after three years. And I took my first bite of food on my 21st birthday. And and I thought that, like, everything was going to be fine. Um, But then a week later, you know, my wound exploded. And I had to be air vacced across the country, which was, like, the most devastating thing because here, like, I thought I had made it, I was eating, I was good. And now I was right back in the hospital and I saw that doctors had no answers, which was very scary for me. But, you know, and and I talk about this in my TEDx talk too, that was probably one of the greatest like detours because I was stuck in that hospital for months with like nothing to do. And I actually started painting for the first time. Um, my mom brought like like cheap little kid craft kits to the hospital. And I found that it was the first way that I could like actually express what I was going to like, like feel things in a way that wasn't like scary and overwhelming, you know, somehow, you know, I could paint tears and it was a way to be with my sadness while it wasn't like overwhelming and scary. And I think that really empowered me to start expressing my feelings and, and process what I had been through because, you know, not eating or drinking, you know, I had to stay very numb. But once I finally could paint, that was like a new voice. So I took to that like crazy. And within the three months there, I made uh, 70 mixed media paintings and I came out of there and put up my first art show. And now like I really felt like I was unstoppable. And for the first time, too, creating that art was also like a bridge to society because putting up that art show was the first time that I was actually getting my myself out there, you know, not just stories about what had happened to me, but I actually had a chance to show people what I was feeling. And the more I painted, the more I started gaining confidence that I could put the words together too. And that led to going back to all of those journal entries that I had written, you know, in secrecy to myself and actually putting them together with songs and writing a one woman musical about my life called Gutless and Grateful, which I premiered in 2012. 
And I had never actually spoken about what had happened to me before from my perspective. And this was a huge risk because I was kind of just bearing it all for the first time. But what was so surprising to me was that not only were people receptive to my story, people could actually relate to my crazy story. So now, like, it wasn't about what I had specifically undergone medically. You know, people were relating to, oh, you know, I've had unexpected things in my life. Uh, I felt that frustration. I felt that anger. I felt that, like, gratitude. And that was actually a very normalizing thing for me. I think that was really how I was able to heal. When I felt like other people could relate to my story, I didn't feel like such an alien anymore. And then that was a big revelation for me. Um, I realized like, wow, we all heal. Like none of this made sense to me. Nothing that had happened made sense until I could actually put it into the framework of a story. You know, the meaning wasn't always there, but I kind of had to make meaning in putting a show together because, you know, a show has to have a a plot and a build-up and a lesson or whatever. And I realized, you know, that was actually really therapeutic for me. And for the first time, like, I found meaning in it. So I think that inspired me to get into, like, the whole mental health community and really um, show people that, you know, once we figure out ways to tell our story, first of all, you know, it eliminates stigma. It brings our stories into the light, which makes us heal. And really, like, we all have a story, and that's really kind of how we create a more compassionate society. When when we, like, learn how to express what has happened to us in a way that's relatable to other people. So that really was, like, kind of a light bulb that took me into all these other venues. And I started taking the show to colleges as a mental health and leadership development program, then into, like, sexual assault centers, to hospitals, and then that really got into entrepreneurship and creativity and and keynotes for business and women's leadership conferences and um and all that, which I never, you know, I never would have anticipated like running my own business from from a show, <laughs> but that's you know led into a, a lot of other things. Framing this as just like detours in my life. I start. I started with like a social media love my detour hashtag, and so many people resonated with it that I have this whole kind of community of detourists and a lot more exciting things to come. So again, that that was kind of all because of adversity. So I think my my biggest you know lesson from that is you know don't just like overcome adversity. You know use it. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. It, it's a great story. One thing I do want to ask is how, how are you able to manage all the different things you're doing when it comes to branding yourself, growing your career, growing your business? Can you talk a little bit more about that? That's a great question. I have that question too, actually. Now, um, you know, what I realize is when I say like I'm a one person show, I am a one person show in every aspect. And, you know, I came in, into this like world of business just with the intention of, I want to share my story. You know, I'm really passionate about this. Like I learned everything as I went, um, which was, you know, really interesting, but really a lot at once. So now I, I have this line in my show, whatever I do, I do obsessively. So like when I decided I was going to tour colleges, like I, there was no easy way to do that. People ask me like, oh, how do you book these colleges? You know, I literally did a Wikipedia of lists of colleges of every state. I went to every college website, searched for every directory, you know, sent letters to student activities, disability, you know, like five emails for every college. And you know what, for like the first thousand emails, I got like radio silence and then I got one, <laughs> you know, and then I got a few and then word of mouth. And, and you know, now I'm booked through, you know, next year, but it, it was all hard work. And so, so now I'm doing all of that still. I'm doing 
all the booking, all the publicity, all the promotion. I'm doing it all on my own. And this year I'm actually starting to question, like, I should probably hire some help at this point. But I think I just try to cram it all in. (laughs) That's a great point. And I I believe uh, a lot of people miss that because you give an example of how you send out thousand emails. And uh, so it comes down to one of the first things to overcome any type of adversity adversity as you mentioned is to start doing something and start putting in a lot of effort so uh, and what and what people don't don't always understand is you know my story didn't just like come out all at once you know for 10 years I was just in my room writing this to myself, you know, and people are like, oh, my God, I can't get started already. You know, mine, I was kind of in a cocoon for a long time, but like I needed that. Like I think to myself, oh, my God, thank God I didn't I didn't have Internet in those days because if I had had social media, I'm not sure that would have been such a good thing. You know, when I tell people like everyone has a story. All that, like, you're also not necessarily kind of ready to tell it right away. You know, it takes time to kind of grow and, you know, you have to process it. So it can be too soon, too. So definitely patience. It's two things, as cliche as they are, like patience and and hard work. Like, people don't see, like, behind the scenes when you're like, oh, how are you all over the place? Uh, because when I'm not all over the place, I'm literally spending every split second, you know, to make that happen. So it's I do put in work that I'm not sure everyone is willing to do. But, um, you know, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. Like eventually I'll need some, some balance. <laughs> that, that's a great point because you mentioned social media. You talked about avoiding distractions. So I think that is something uh, a lot of people get caught into. Uh, instead of getting the actual work done, it could get distracting. Uh, so yours is a classic example. You put in the effort and here you are. Uh, now you're fully booked as a speaker. So uh, one thing I always uh, read about is uh, the whole concept of speaking at TED Talks, and which you have done and you've got another one coming next month. So how did that story come up, come about? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and I got asked so many times that I actually have a free ebook on my site with tips that I can give you the link to. Um, but there is, you know, TEDx talks are very different from speaking. You don't just like book yourself or have the right connections or contact the right people. Anyone can apply and it's a very um, rigorous application process. And, you know, like when you go through a few rounds, you got to write a lot of essays. You'll do a live audition. And what they're really looking for is they're not just looking for, they're not looking for credentials at all. You will vary from committee, but, and they're not just looking for a really smart speech or a powerful speech or persuasive speech. They're really looking for a story, like the, with an idea, like literally an idea worth spreading. Something, you gotta do your research, you know. Watch as many as you can. First of all, you can't lose anything by watching. I mean, they're, it's like the best 10 minutes you'll ever spend. <laughs> but I think the best way to start is just watching because really the idea is, and to be able to shape it as a story in 10 minutes is is very difficult. You know, they really want to know that, you know, each TEDx has a different theme. They want to know how that story is going to be not only relevant to the theme, but relevant to anyone who's not into your specific interest. Um, you know, when I say like my show, Gutless and Grateful, was brought out the stories in everyone, that's kind of what a TED Talk tries to do. Um, take one story and one idea and and make it not only worth spreading, but, you know, easy to be spread and that people want to spread it. Thanks for uh, sharing that as well. Uh, so I, I was asked about your story, I've asked about how, how to do certain things. What, uh, what is your advice for people who make excuses? And I'm going, to, I'm going to preface by saying this. A lot of people go through this, uh, especially when they come to any type of adversity. I'm talking about adversity. Uh, people, what I notice is nowadays everything's in adversity. You don't get enough social media likes. 
that becomes an adversity. Oh my God, I know. So, uh, yeah. or even, even for example, <laughs> let's say you don't get the promotion at your job or anything. So that a lot of people make excuses and I'm sure I've made that in my past as well. So what would your advice be for uh, people making excuses or excuses in general? Listen, the truth is, setbacks and disappointments are discouraging. Um, they can make you kind of drag your feet a little. And I, you know, I say rather than push yourself, if you need to step away for a second and just objectively notice that you need some space from that, that's fine. But, you know, that pity and the, you know, I can't do this and first of all, I can't, you know, that's just like an end stop. Um, so, you know, you don't want to push yourself if if you feel like you know like I am disappointed you know that's why I discovered painting because it was a way I could be with those negative feelings in a healthy way you know there are a lot of healthy ways to to deal with you know feelings about adversity but but find those ways um rather than let it say you know I can't or I shouldn't be doing this um I think that was the most helpful feedback for me you know definitely not the idea of just suck it up because you know I've experienced firsthand that the more we kind of press those feelings down the more they come up behind us so do some self-searching and find out ways you can kind of be with those negative things because negative things are real but we don't need to let them get bigger by thinking oh my god you know, I feel so awful at this or, no, I'm not going to think about it. I'll just keep going. So, yeah, just give it this space and and then get back on. You know, I ended up going to college at 25. So, you know, it's the idea that it's never too late to kind of restart things. The last question before we conclude is uh, one, of, one of the things, of course, you spend so much time today talking about your story. I've listened to your other speeches and podcasts. It's you share your a very personal story, even though the term like going back to the topic of personal branding, everybody talks about it. But uh, yep. how do you overcome that concern that people have that how much of my personal information should I share? So, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Because some people try to keep it. Professional. Yeah. No, you're right, because my what I do specifically did all come from that, mostly because. I didn't come in with a business mindset. You know, I didn't think, um, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to use what happened to me. It was like, eh, all of this came because I was like, I really want to just share my story. Oh, look, this can be like business. Like, look at that. Um, but, but now that I'm actually doing things, you know, I'm definitely thinking about, especially as I'm preparing to give another TEDx talk and the other one was so deeply personal. Like, okay, you know, part of my healing process was getting my story out now that it's out and I feel that kind of therapeutic effect, like where do I want to go from here? Because the truth is that was over a decade ago and you know, things in my life are still happening and I'm still creating. So, you know, this is definitely embarking on a new chapter for me. Um, but I'd say, you know, some people just want to keep them professional. You know, I, I know I have a lot of like friends, like an example, that do like freelance writing and they've been told to like promote their articles on social media. And they're like, well, I don't really want to promote it on my personal account. And there is a power to spreading your business with the power of a personal story. But that being said, there are so many aspects to our personal lives that we can always, you know, find our boundaries and decide what we can tell and what we can't tell, you know, like seeing like, like a rainbow on the street, like that's a personal story too. You know, we don't have to get into everything. So I'd say that that's totally, you know, it should always be your choice. Thanks for uh, summarizing a lot of things. So one of the final things I wanted to share is I wanted to repeat myself. Uh, anybody listening uh, who is concerned about any sort of minor adversity that has happened to you or minor setback, your story isn't as bad as what has happened to Amy and, and how she has overcome that adversity to become the person she is today and also to build her business the way it is today. So I wanted to, yeah, anyone listening to this, I think your adversity is in, keep your adversity in perspective, learn how to bounce back uh, as Amy has shared her story extensively. So 
Uh, Amy, th- thanks for joining us. One of the last things I wanted to ask. Thank is, you. Any final words before we sign off today? Oh, when all else fails, label a paper from A to Z and make make yourself come up with one thing you're grateful for. For every list, it was house. Um, the other thing is, um, like I said, if you want, you know, my tips on getting a TEDx talk, I can give you that link if you want um, for your when you post the the interview. But um, you know, my website is amyoes.com, and I have plenty of resources there. You can also see my TEDx talk. I mostly would love to hear from you guys, and you know, I also have a feature on my blog once a week where I have, you know, what I call a detourist write in about any kind of detour in their life and how it made them who they are. And I think it's a great thing because um, these are, these can be good detours. Like, oh, you know, I happened to land this job and I never knew it would expect me, you know, to lead to this. But I, I think the more stories we hear, the more empowered we are. So if you have even just an inkling of a desire to share your story, definitely send me a note. So my website's amyoes.com. I'm also on Twitter way too much um, at amyoes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to add that to the summary section of the uh, episode. When it is yeah, summary. yeah, great. On behalf of everyone, thank you very much. It was a pleasure learning from you, Amy, and you shared an amazing story for us. Thank you so much for having me. I love the topic. (laughs) You're welcome. So thanks, folks, for listening to this episode of the Career Medis Podcast. I have written a brief summary of the interview with links to Amy's website and also a link to the TEDx talk as well as part of a blog post. Uh, If you liked what you heard, feel free to subscribe to the Career Medis Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and even TuneIn. And for more content, ideas, tips, resources, go to careermedis.com. If you enjoyed the episode, also learn, and if you learned something new, uh, feel free to post a review or a comment. And if you really loved it, definitely go ahead and share the episode among your network. Until next time, this is Nisar Ahmad, your host for the Career Medics Podcast. Thank you.